Thank you, uh, Boulder Community Hospital. Thank you, uh, Boulder JCC. And uh, thank you to our veterans uh, for your service and bravery. Um, thank you for joining uh, this talk. Um, I'll be uh, speaking on uh, relieving shoulder pain and rotator cuff injuries. Um, the rotator cuff and the shoulder uh, have been uh, looked at and studied for about 100 years. And I'll try to cover that uh, in about one hour. Uh, I'm from Southern California, uh, went to uh, school at UC Irvine, uh, went to uh, CU School of Medicine uh, for medical school, and then ended up in Boston uh, for my residency training, and ended up uh, through a sports medicine fellowship in Taos, uh, New Mexico, and I've been fortunate to be here in Boulder uh, for over 13 years. Uh, so tonight's goals uh, to look at an overview and a 30,000 foot view uh, is to highlight the importance of the rotator cuff, uh, to understand the normal shoulder and the rotator cuff, uh, to get an understanding of the abnormal cuff, and uh, go over some st uh, treatment strategies, uh, sprinkle in a little bit of science, uh, recognize some of the controversies surrounding rotator cuff treatment, and uh, take questions uh, from our online audience. So why is the rotator cuff so important and why is my shoulder so important? Uh, basically, it's pain. Uh, when I have pain in my shoulder, it affects how I work, how I play, how I sleep. It affects my activities of daily living. Uh, it's really the painful, soft parts in between the bones of my shoulder. And the incidence of tears between the ages of 40 and 60 are about 40 and 60 percent. So this kind of highlights the importance of the shoulder and the rotator cuff. So the normal shoulder, uh, the analogy uh, is basically a golf ball and a golf tee. Uh, when you have uh, the glenoid here, which is the bony part, and the humeral head, which is the bony part, the golf ball needs to sit directly on the center of the glenoid. And in a normal shoulder, this relationship is balanced. And the musculature is what creates this balance of the rotator cuff. Similar to a Chinese finger trap, as you pull har harder and stabilize the shoulder, the shoulder becomes more stable and more balanced. These tendons surround the outside of the capsule, and these tendons are attached to the bone, and the muscles pulling through the tendon attached to the bone moves through the joint. So as I said, balance is important, and the rotator cuff uses these coupled forces to balance the shoulder so that forward flexion matches extension abduction matches adduction, external rotation matches internal rotation, and keeps the, keeps the golf ball on the golf tee. So the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres minor are traditionally what we understand as the rotator cuff. And the supraspinatus is responsible for a abduction away from the body. Infraspinatus and teres minor are responsible for external rotation. And the special rotator cuff that not many people talk about is a subscapularis, which is underneath the scapula and is responsible for internal rotation. So the sits tendons, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis creates balance in the shoulder. So what are some of the cuff injury types? Is everything a tear? No, some can have a strain. We can have inflammation of the tendon. We can have inflammation of the bursa or cuff bursitis. We can have a partial tear. We can have a full thickness tear. We can have a really bad massive tear with fatty atrophy and infiltration. And we can actually have calcium deposits in the rotator cuff. So all of these are injury types of rotator cuff disease. 
So what causes cuff injury? Age. Falls, accidents, trauma directly onto the shoulder. Mechanical impingement of the shoulder. If you're in a cave and you see a limestone cave with a deposit, impingement of the shoulder is very similar, where you have a bone spur on top, on the underside of the acromion, and whenever you lift your shoulder up, it can actually saw into the rotator cuff. So overhead sports like volleyball or tennis or swimming or climbing, impingement of the shoulder can be in a concept to cause cuff injury. There's also biology, inherent biology. The slide here on the right shows good vessels penetrating the rotator cuff. But as we get older, it starts to become a watershed zone. The bone supplies blood, the muscle supplies blood, but as we get older, this becomes an avascular uh, tendon area without blood supply. So to recap, age or life miles, trauma or falling, mechanical impingement, or an intrinsic biology problem. So really what we need to understand is how does a tear cause pain? Because that's what I'm experiencing and that's what my shoulder is experiencing as a cuff tear. And we really don't have a good handle on it, but it's most likely the inflammation around the capsule that causes pain. In general, inflammation causes pain, inflammation of the bursa can cause pain, but inflammation of the capsule probably causes the most pain around rotator cuff tears. Because in some of our studies, 40% of cuff tears, if you were to look on an MRI, have no symptoms. So we don't really understand why that is. Sometimes when you have an imbalance of the shoulder, when your rotator cuff is torn or non-functional, Muscle spasm can also cause pain. And when we look at our surgical success rates, the surgical success rate of rotator cuff repairs are about 90%. Yet if you look at imaging studies after rotator cuff repairs, up to 40% can have a re-tear. So that doesn't quite correlate. So as a patient, how do I know that I have a cuff tear? Well, seeing a, a provider can be helpful, get a detailed interview and a history, supplying a detailed story. When do you have the pain? Is it during activity? Is it during sleep? Is it when, it when I reach behind my back? When I shampoo my hair? How old am I? What's my occupation? Do I do a lot of heavy lifting? What sports do I like? What's my athletics? And do I have any history of accumulated trauma? So your provider is gonna offer you an exam. This should include a postural exam. Do I have good sagittal balance? Do I have an upright posture and externally rotated shoulders? And there are some provocative tests that your provider will do to test some of these rotator cuff functions. Your provider will also order some imaging. X-rays can be helpful, ultrasound, MRI, needle arthroscopy in office, CT arthrograms are a few. X-rays typically are often, are often uh, normal, but as you can see here on the right, you can see a spur on the acromion, which we talked about that mechanical impingement earlier that can saw into the rotator cuff. You can also see in an x-ray where the rotator cuff is deficient here, where the acromion and the humerus have very little spacing. And so a narrow acromiohumeral distance where typically a rotator cuff tendon would exist is no longer existing. Even though the glenohumeral joint here has good spacing, 
the acromiohumeral joint does not, which gives us a indication that the rotator cuff is non-existent. Ultrasound is widely used in Europe uh, and other countries. In the United States, we're starting to use that in the office. Um, but MRIs really are kind of the gold standard here, um, and especially in Boulder. They're amazing. They have very accurate images. And when you look here at this MRI and this arrow right here, you can see this sort of tongue-like uh, appendage right here, which is the rotator cuff that should be attached to this flat portion of the greater tuberosity. And you have vacancy and a fluid-filled space right here. So MRIs are very accurate. So now what? You've seen your provider. You've given a good detailed story and a history. You've had a thorough physical exam. You had complete imaging studies. Uh, the diagnostic accuracy is very good with all these three uh, components. And now you've been diagnosed with a cuff tear. What questions do I ask? Uh, and these are questions that my patients ask me and I think are, are very uh, valuable and they've uh, informed me and educated me. Uh, knowing the natural history of the cuff tear, does it all need treatment? Do I need surgery? Do I need injections? What if I just leave it alone? So that's what the, na that's what the natural history of a cuff tear uh, question is about. Is it partial? Is it half? Is it a quarter? Is it full thickness? And what's the severity of this cuff tear? What are some common interventions that surgical and non-surgical people apply? What are the outcomes of those treatment strategies? What would you do if this were your shoulder and you had a cuff tear? And one question that a patient should ask themselves and then ask the provider is, am I treating the dysfunction of my shoulder or am I treating pain? And that's where the discussion between the patient and the provider can drum up some information and expose some information of, is my shoulder functional during sports or activities or work, or am I limited by pain? So what are my goals? And another useful score to use during a clinical examination is a SANE score, which is a single assessment numerical evaluation which is basically a scale from 0 to 100, and 100 being a perfect shoulder, whether that's by function or pain or attitude. It's just a final grade, and 0 being the worst. So what are some of the treatment strategies? Like I had said, are we, treat are we treating the pain or the dysfunction? What are the patient goals? Do I have six months to rehab can I do the work after surgery? And can I be in a sling for six to eight weeks? So some of the treatment strategies that I employ are a little tincture of time. Sometimes time heals most wounds. Uh, physical therapy. Shoulders are highly responsive to strengthening. Capsular mobility. Manipulation. Postural work. Massage. Uh, injections can be super helpful. Injections into the joint of steroids or platelet-rich plasma, prolotherapy, stem cells, so regenerative medicine can be super helpful. Surgery, do you just debride the rotator cuff or can you fix it? Revision surgery, do you refix it if it re-tears? And like we had talked about, 90% clinical outcomes of rotator cuff tears and repairs are good, but 40% re-tear. And are these worth refixing? Or do we go further into the treatment innovations, and we'll explain this a little bit later, of the SCR, or superior capsular reconstruction, or the in-space balloon? And really, patient education and understanding are important in treatment strategies. So what are some of the treatment innovations and what are employed? Uh, arthroscopic surgery open superior capsular reconstruction surgery, uh, in-space balloons, reverse total shoulder replacement, and biologic regenerative medicine. So when we're looking at arthroscopic images of the cuff tear, on here on the left, 
you can see this crescentic cave. You can kind of see shredded crab looking meat. That is what a cuff tear looks like under arthroscopic view. And when a surgeon goes in and puts in anchors here and here, those anchors are tied to ropes and anchors down. So this is what's called a double row configuration. And so here is a rotator cuff tear. And here is the arthroscopic repair, which is currently the gold standard. What do we do if the tear is irreparable? So let's say on this image, that tear was further into the picture and unable to move to the footprint. You can put a patch on it. And that's what the superior capsular reconstruction is. When you have a tear that's so far medial and difficult to pull that you have to put a patch on this. And that's a great pain relieving procedure. The in-space balloon is in uh, studies currently. I don't believe it's for the general public, but it's in studies right now. And this actually addresses pain. So if you have a rotator cuff, that, a tear that's torn, irretract or retra irre irretractable, can't move, and the acromiohumeral distance is narrow and you're hitting bone on bone, just like in my previous x-ray slide, you can actually put in a balloon spacer that is pretty simple, about a half hour procedure that can reduce pain. I'd like to see this uh, come out soon, but we're still in uh, experimental trials. What if my rotator cuff is torn and I should have seen a provider 20 years ago and my shoulder kept functioning, I kept climbing, I kept swimming, I kept surfing, I kept gardening, and my shoulder became arthritic. Then we go into shoulder replacement strategies. Now, anatomic shoulder replacement, which is the middle slide here, is not the scope of this talk, but really the reverse shoulder replacement where you flip the ball and the cup in an arthritic shoulder with a rotator cuff tear can be very helpful and has a very low uh, rehab uh, timing and can be very successful. So that's called a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. And then uh, regenerative medicine can be very interesting. Um, I've been using this in partial tears, uh, bursitis. Uh, there are a lot of folks here in Boulder that are championing and pioneering uh, some of this work. And basically that's taking your own healing blood and fluid and PRP and stem cells and PRFM. There's all these uh, different words for it. But basically can we inject really super healthy, fun fluid into the rotator cuff and heal that rotator cuff tear? Studies are showing some promising results, uh, but it's still uh, in the scientific phase, but we are using it now because the risk is low and potential benefit is high. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Sang. Um, I'm just gonna get to a few of our questions in just a moment. Um, here's one. Um, can a partial tear of a rota rotator cuff tendon, I guess supra-stenatus, heal itself over time, and if so, how long would it take? So the question is, can a partial tear of the supraspinatus heal over time, and how long will it take? So my first, we'll give you a couple scenarios. So the younger you are, the better healing rate. Um, the older you are, uh, the slower healing rate. 
Uh, in general, on the first couple slides that I had when we talked about the avascular zone of the rotator cuff, uh, it, it makes healing of partial tears tough. Most likely, partial tears will stay stable and quiescent. And so things that we're doing to help rota partial rotator cuffs heal would be regenerative medicine, uh, adding some biology to that rotator cuff. So in general, if, if we looked at studies and MRIs of partial tears, and we had sequential MRIs, uh, let's say, for instance, 35 years old, uh, an MRI every year, if you had a partial tear, will most likely stay a partial tear. But that doesn't mean clinically that your shoulder can't get better and more functional. So again, it's kind of understanding, is it just because you have a tear, what are your symptoms that you're experiencing? And is it pain or dysfunction? And what are your goals? Uh, here's another one. My shoulder burns all night after a day of house cleaning or repetitive use. My whole clavicle area feels tight. What can I do? So the question is, my shoulder's burning and it hurts in the clavicle area. Um, the first thing is to get an evaluation, a proper evaluation. Um, so uh, let, me, let me try to rephrase the question a little bit so, or, or, or come at it a different approach. So m most of the time, shoulder and rotator cuff pathology is over the lateral aspect of the shoulder. It stays around the shoulder girdle. Uh, typically, it can be a dull and sore pain. When I hear burning over the clavicle, uh, I think of other things. Um, it's not a classic finding. Uh, but that's part of why we see our providers and get a more detailed history. You know, is it overhead motion? Is it when you sleep? Uh, examination findings are important. Uh, and x-ray findings uh, are important. Imaging findings are important. Okay. What is the rehab time for reverse shoulder replacement? Three months. Uh, it all depends on sort of what you want to get out of it. Um, if you are a candidate for a reverse shoulder replacement, uh, in general, those patients are a bit older. Uh, they've either, they've either, either gone through rotator cuff and had a failed rotator cuff or a natural history of a rotator cuff that went to a massive cuff tear and arthritis. And when you replace the shoulder and you do a reverse shoulder replacement, you don't necessarily rely on the soft tissue structures about the shoulder because they're gone. And so once the implants are in, they're fairly stable. And most people can return to basic activities of daily living within three months. And it all depends on sort of what you do and what you want to do and what are your goals of the reverse shoulder replacement. But most people at that point in time have very limited function of their shoulder. And so the expectations and the goals are probably a bit more realistic as far as activities of daily living. And so the rehab can be quite quick. After age 80, is there much benefit in physical therapy? After, excuse, what was? Age 80. After age 80, is there benefit in physical therapy? Yes. Okay, and we'll just get to another one right here. What is the repair fluid? The repair fluid. I can also jump to another one. Um, So I, I'm not exactly sure if I understand the question. So the question is, what is the repair fluid? Uh, if I had to read into it, what is the regenerative 
biologic healing. So when we talk about regenerative medicine, uh, there are a few different fluid types. Uh, we have stem cells that are uh, pluripotent stem cells that can kind of turn into whatever tissue you'd like it to turn into. Uh, we have PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma. Uh, we have a fibrin matrix. There's a lot of different formulations of healing fluids and regenerative fluids. Um, and that's what makes it a little bit difficult for us to understand what works and what doesn't because we have so many different varieties of fluids that can help repair a rotator cuff. Uh, some people use whole blood. Uh, I have never used that. Um, most of the time we, here we use PRP and stem cells. Um, how does uh, scoliosis affect rotator cuff surgery? Hmm. How does scoliosis affect rotator cuff surgery? So if it's determined that your rotator cuff needs surgery, my first thought is what is your position like? What is your thoracic posture like? And what is your function? And what is your ability to do rehab? Mm -hmm. And so my first thought is when people have scoliosis, whether it's a coronal curve or a sagittal curve and kyphosis, uh, part of rotator cuff rehab depends on an upright posture and a pulled back posture. But sometimes if you, have, if you have a fixed deformity, your shoulder could be more caved over, and that's what you have to kind of work with. Now, if it's determined that you have rotator cuff tearing and then you need surgery, you kind of isolate the shoulder, but then the therapy and the rehab really have to take into account what your makeup is. That is the rehab. Now, when you're talking about the actual surgery, surgery and the procedure, sometimes it can be a challenge because positioning on the operating room table is a little bit different. Depends on how severe your scoliosis is. There are anesthetic issues uh, if you are kyphotic and looking down here. So that could be more medical-related issues. So that's kind of a two-part question. Could you briefly explain your comments of pain versus function? Would the treatments be different, and if so, how? Right. So there is a difference between pain and function. They're definitely linked. And so the question is, what is the difference between pain in a rotator cuff injury and function in a rotator cuff injury, and how does that, how does that change with my treatment plan? So, so pain is... I have wonderful function of my shoulder, but it hurts, right? Versus I can't lift up my shoulder, but it's pain-free. And so treating the symptom is helpful. And when you have pain with good function, sometimes... A steroid shot and physical therapy can be very helpful. If you fell and now your arm can't lift up, but you have no pain, I may offer you surgery to help with the function. Now, they are related and they are tied, but you have to kind of understand what your goals are depending on what the scenario is with your shoulder. Is frozen shoulder syndrome a result of a rotator cuff problem? Is frozen shoulder syndrome a rotator cuff problem? Rotator cuff problems can lead to frozen shoulder. And the definition of frozen shoulder is, I can't move my shoulder and it's painful. And so I lift my shoulder and it hurts and I can't move it in any plane. And rotator cuff injuries can lead to frozen shoulder, but most likely 
a frozen shoulder, we don't know why it happens. Sometimes it's related to diabetes and endocrine problems and thyroid disease. And sometimes it's just insidious onset and it just happens. So um, not necessarily causal, uh, but it can be related. Okay, I'm gonna try and answer, get this one as, as best I can, so bear with me. Um, can any of these treatments be done with intubation? A, I'm 76 with a heart condition and a collapsing trachea, reaching for anything hurts. So can, uh, what is the, the question is, can any of these procedures be done without intubation? Uh, yes, without intubation. So is the question treating rotator cuff injuries without anesthesia or surgery? I believe so. Okay. Um, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of different in-office procedures that we can do, uh, but to actually do a rotator cuff repair or to do anything surgically, you need to have general anesthesia. It's very close up into this area, and you can't really do just a regional block, which is a needle into the shoulder and numbs the whole arm, like you would say do for hip arthritis and a total hip replacement, where you can do just a spinal. And if that's kind of the gist of the question, most rotator cuff repair surgeries require general anesthesia. Okay. And let me just find one more here. Give me one moment. Okay. After, um, oh, sorry, one second. After an MRI, my doctor said, that my rotator cuff is gone. What options do I have? So after, after my MRI, my doctor said, my rotator cuff is gone. What are my options? Uh, my first question is, how old are you? And let's say the scenario is you are 60. Um, then my next question is, did the MRI look like the rotator cuff had a lot of fatty infiltration? And was it a traumatic injury or a chronic injury? Did you fall and the rotator cuff is gone? Or was it just kind of a long-standing history? Um, Depending on your age, let's say you're 60 and your rotator cuff is gone, and let's hypothesize that your cartilage looks good, then you might be a candidate for a superior capsular reconstruction. Let's say your rotator cuff is gone and you have arthritis, then you might be a candidate for reverse shoulder replacement. Let's say you're 80 years old and your rotator cuff is gone, most likely a reverse total shoulder replacement candidate. What is the best treatment for scar tissue from a tear? Hmm. What is the best treatment for scar tissue from a tear? Uh, my first thought is you're having issues with mobility, and that's why there's scar tissue in there. Um, depends if it's after surgery or before surgery. In general, I think physical therapy is super helpful. Uh, manual therapy is helpful. Capsular mobility is helpful. Now, if this scar tissue is another word for frozen shoulder after a rotator cuff repair, Sometimes going in there surgically and removing the scar tissue and manipulating the shoulder could be super helpful. How closely does severity of symptoms correlate with the need for surgery? Uh, 
I think my third or fourth slide, when I, when I reference and I look at rotator cuff tearing, uh, the question is how closely associated is severity of symptoms to the need for surgery? And honestly, it's not one-to-one. -one. Um, some rotator cuff repairs do really well, and they re-tear, and they still do really well. Some people have massive tears with arthritis and function very well. So the severity of symptoms is part of the decision-making of surgery, but not entirely weighted to surgery. What stretches do you re recommend for sh shoulder health at, for any age? In general, if you look like this, be more like this. So an upright posture, a pulled back shoulder is always a healthy shoulder position. And anything to open up the chest and get your arm overhead is probably the best and simplest shoulder stretch that you can do. I'm going to kind of piggyback on that last question. So um, can relief be obtained by, uh, can any relief be obtained by shoulder exercise slash therapy without surgery? Can any relief of shoulder pain be relieved, or can any relief be achieved by physical therapy? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hold on one moment. If you have osteoporosis, do you need to address that prior to surgical repair? My first thought is not directly. Um, how it affects the shoulder is sometimes uh, you can get cystic areas, thin bone uh, in the area of rotator cuff repair. So when you're putting anchors into the bone, uh, you're relying on that bone to be fairly solid and holding that anchor. And so if you're talking about osteoporosis, and trying to remedy that before rotator cuff surgery, my first thought is you don't have to necessarily completely cure it. Uh, my second thought is you have to kind of understand the risks of rotator cuff repair and osteoporosis. And part of that is just the ability and the age and the, um, the function and the healing rates at that age of osteoporosis. So indirect. Um, I'm age 65. I'm trying to treat shoulder pain at home before any imaging. Is it better to let it rest or to do shoulder physical therapy and for how long? So I'm age 65 and I'm doing shoulder therapy at home. Is it better to rest or do therapy? And I think straddling both would be good. Uh, I think active recovery is good. Um, one extreme of not using your shoulder and keeping it a sling can be helpful for a few days, but that can set you up for a frozen shoulder. Um, doing too much, walking on your hands, doing 100 push-ups, probably not the right idea. So there's definitely a sweet spot between rest and active recovery and rehab. This is uh, from Guest70. I have great flexibility, but have pain when any type of pressure is applied to the shoulder. Um, is this an indication of rotator cuff injury? So the question is, I have great flexibility and pain in my shoulder. Is this, indica is this an indication of rotator cuff pathology or disease? Um, probably needs a further study, but not necessarily. Okay. Okay, hold on one moment. Okay, hold on 
one moment, and I will just get to the next one. Okay. Would PRP, stem cell therapy, or HGH be good options to further strengthen a surgically repaired rotator cuff? So is PRP, stem cells, or HGH helpful to strengthen rotator cuff repair after surgery? So there have been a few studies using rotator cuff repair and PRP, and the results have been equivocal as far as looking at the healing rates and the strengths of the rotator cuff. Um, HGH is a hormone, so that's not a directly injectable uh, like a stem cell or a PRP. Uh, there are promising results that show that augmenting biology is helpful, uh, but the jury is out whether we should use that widespread, uh, but we are starting to implement those strategies. Okay. And um, this one is, you showed a slide near the end uh, you showed a slide near the end showing an injection to repair the cuff without specifying the fluid used. Correct. So at the end of the slide, um, healing fluid is basically regenerative medicine. Uh, PRP, stem cells, lots of different things that we can do in there. And again, the jury's out on sort of what we need to use, what formulation we need to use, at what stage of tearing or what stage of pre- or post-surgery we need to do that. Great. Um, here's one. How long should one do physical therapy before deciding it's not being effective? I say a good trial of physical therapy before understanding if we need to progress to surgery, can vary for different people. But I think no, uh, about a six to eight week course can at least develop and, uh, and you can understand if you're on the right path towards recovery. You may not be completely 100% cured, but you should know that this is working or not after about six to eight weeks. Okay. I have two loose bodies in my shoulder. They occasionally flare up and the pain is unbearable, but then the pain goes away. What could this be? The question is, I have two loose bodies in my shoulder and, the, and sometimes the pain is unbearable and sometimes it goes away. So the first question is, where are those loose bodies from? Uh, is it cartilage? Is it bone? You know, why do you have loose bodies in there? And there are a couple different scenarios that I see loose bodies, and one is synovial chondromatosis, which is a, a condition where you just create cartilage bodies, and another is arthritis. Uh, and so those two entities don't necessarily mean you have a rotator cuff tear, uh, and in general, you should probably get those loose bodies out. Okay. All right. Is there a risk to repeated steroid injections even though they bring good relief? Is there a risk to repeated steroid injections into the shoulder? Uh, yes, there absolutely is. There's an entity called steroid tendinopathy, and one injection of steroid might be okay, but repeated successive stacked steroid injections can actually cause further tendon tearing. Okay, great. Um, okay, and next one. Um, my shoulder and arm are weakened by long avoiding use. What do you re recommend for strengthening? So my shoulder is weakened by long... Uh, avoided use. Avoided use, so not using it. Yes. Um, uh, kind of a uh, tough question to to answer um, depends on sort of what you're doing, probably needs a, a further evaluation of, of why you're not using your shoulder and um, in what planes uh, is your shoulder weak. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And we might be coming to the end of our question portion. Um, I have a new pain at night in the shoulder that I sleep on. How do I mitigate that? I have a new pain at night. 
on the shoulder that I sleep shoulder on. that I sleep on. How do I mitigate that? Um, again, kind of a general question. Um, you know, you can try some shoulder mobility, some shoulder stretches. Uh, you can take Advil, but I think trying to find out the source of the pain is important. Okay. All right. I have had major shoulder surgery two years ago. I'm having the same issues with pain running to, down to my biceps as well as spurs. Um, what is happening? I, have ma I had major shoulder surgery and I still have pain into my biceps. So my first question is what shoulder surgery did you have? Um, and probably takes further evaluation. Okay. Can an anti-inflammatory diet be helpful for shoulder pain? Can an anti-inflammatory diet be helpful for shoulder pain? Yes. Okay. Okay, and we're just going to give one moment to catch up, and then we will have another um, batch of questions. Okay, and I think that's going to be the end of our portion. So Great. I want to thank you, Dr. Sang. Thank you. And we've come to the end of our time. A recording of tonight's lecture is available at bch.org slash live stream. You will receive a post-lecture survey by email tomorrow. Please take a minute to fill this out. Thank you for joining us and have a good night.